Good morning, guys. Um, welcome to my first Tech Talk for 2020. All of the best to the guys that have started. Good on you. For the other guys, shame on you. Let's get straight into this morning's topic, car wash facilities. Um, it's something that has become a bit of a problem. Wherever you ride through town, you see nice soapy water floating down the, the stormwater um, or along the curbs and all kinds of funny things. And it's happening more and more often. And um, for the guys that have looked at Herman's latest present or the presentations, you would have seen there's this staunch gentleman standing there that says that no one will affect the nation's health more than a plumber. So if we need to get involved with it, then we need to get going with it. So let's get straight into it before I fall behind. Here we go. When we're talking car wash facilities, the standards and all the documents refer to both formal and informal. Uh, informal, more bucket, hosepipe type effect. and um, the formal ones, sorry, let me just get my hand out yet. There we go. The formal ones are the ones that we, we like spending time having a coffee while your vehicle's being cleaned. So let's start by looking at drainage from these washing areas. You'll see in both cases, formal or informal, um, we just can, I'm just going to refer to washing areas. Both of them apply as we go through the standard. The standard refers to these areas as any building used as a stable, garage, cow shed, dairy, kennel, butchery, abattoir, or in our case this morning, any vehicle washing area or any other similar area that requires regular cleansing and which produces wastewater or soil water that shall be connected to a drain which serves that building or area. So the requirement is set out in the first first paragraph or in the first section it refers to you shall have a drain working along or picking up that wastewater when we're looking at that specific area the standard then continues it says that area shall be paved with a suitable impervious material and be graded to a gully which shall be fitted with a removable grating and to be connected to a suitable grease petrol or oil interceptor or the combination of the two in accordance with the requirements of We'll have a look at that standard now and or the SANS 10252. So let's start with the one that we're more familiar with or the one that we should have a copy of. Light liquid interceptor shall be covered in a tight and traffic safe manner and the cover shall be non-flammable for obvious reasons, not be secured and permit the removal of fine sludge and light liquids. It's senseless having this uh, light liquid interceptor if you can't clean it out and you can't empty the light liquid out of it. Uh, you'll see under the commentary, a sand seal should be sufficient. So we don't want any buildup of, of uh, flammable gases in that. So it shall not be possible to draw water, wastewater off through the outlet pipe to the extent that the separated light liquid reaches the outlet or for the intercepted liquid to backflow into the inlet pipe. Only wastewater that requires separation shall discharge into a light liquid interceptor and that shall discharge into a drain. In other words, you can't have a basin and toilets and all the other things that that are around the car wash or around that filling station or wherever this car wash in the in a, in a shopping center or wherever um, it's all down to only that um, wastewater that requires separation will go into that there so then uh, we'll go through a, you get a normal like a straightforward um, self-closing one very comp well not complicated but uh, very few guys use them because their maintenance gets neglected the little float get stuck and they end up being of no use and then the standard says a light liquid interceptor for liquids that have a density up to 0.85 kilograms per liter such as petrol diesel and fuel is illustrated in figure eight so that would be figure eight very simple process very very rudimentary um there's no complications around it. it. Once it works, it works forever. You just need to do your, your maintenance on it. In this case, you can see the inlet comes or the water from that wash area or that car wash comes in and it discharges into this chamber. At the same time, this little fin or this separator here 
keeps the light liquid from getting to the point of the outlet. So the water would go in here and it would simply go out on the outlet side and disappear. For the more complicated ones, you'll find, that, or the smaller ones that need cleaning more often, you'll find that most of the guys actually have an overflow, so this light liquid end up going into a separate container. For the bigger ones, if you Google it, you'll see some of them have like these monstrous tanks. They get cleaned out less often, but the point is you need to separate it, and once it's separated, we read that little requirement now, that none of this separated light liquid should be able to go back into the drain, and it cannot be empty to the point where that actually leaves the, the chamber cell. So once it's in this chamber, it gets cleaned out there and nothing moves to the other side. The other standard we looked at was 50858. Um, there's two parts of it. The first part says that there are principles of product design, performance, and testing, marking, and quality control. In other words, um, if you are going to buy a prefab unit or you are going to, to buy into a system that is being marketed that needs to comply with that standard. And then the second part, obviously, the selection of the size, installation, operation, and maintenance. That's where the plumber comes in and he says, Manir, I am qualified to do this. I can sort this out for you. The standard then also refers to the one that says or a combination of. In this case, I can tell you this is from a truck wash that's been here in Port Elizabeth for the last 40 years, and I don't think I've ever heard about it failing or giving hassles. Um, you collect the sand portion or all the other solids and foreign material get caught in the first chamber. This gets cleaned out regularly. And then you have the same principle that it falls through and it goes through and you end up in the sampling point. Sampling by the owner, if he's, if he's uh, on top of his game, you sample before the local authority so that you know that your effluent that discharges into the sewer actually complies and you make sure that it works to the point where the requirements from the trade effluent guys, if you exceed the chemicals or the fuel or the oil or anything like that, they, they, they penalize you. So maintaining this chamber is of utmost, uh, utmost importance. So point B, it shall be roofed over. Uh, it's not a it's not a recommendation. I left that on the top there of all these things here, so that there's a there's a reference to the standard uh, when it deals with these washing areas. It shall be roofed over. We don't want any rainwater falling on this portion here because that would be contrary to the to the act. So part B says roofed over. Part C says it shall be surrounded by a curb not less than 100 mil high or be elevated above the immediate ground surrounding ground level by not less, than, not less than 100. So what we have got here is your chamber or your gully or your channel going to the gully, but that goes away to your drainage system. We need 100 mil of elevation here to keep the blue lines of the stormwater or the rainwater, so that will go in its own direction. And the um, soapy water or the, the, the wastewater would then end up going back down into that drainage system. Okay, so the sorry, here we go. Typical example of an area that was not done as per that detail. Um, you'll find that the 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 in this case here it was somewhere up in Houting. I can't remember exactly where, but you can imagine if you have a chamber that is supposed to separate little bits of fuel from your normal drainage, and you have this whole area basically submerged when it rains. Um, nice little afternoon thunder shower and your whole drainage system is gone to put. The point is that when it comes to getting punished, we know that the guys don't worry about, or they don't worry, they, your local authority bylaws step up into the, the standards and the standards into the uh, application of the building regulations. And the building regulation says, no person shall cause or permit sewage including wastewater, discharge from any fixture to enter a stormwater drain, stormwater sewer, or excavated water course, subject to the Water Act, any river, stream, or natural water course, whether ordinarily dry or otherwise, doesn't make a difference, you're not allowed in there, or any street or other site. And then the second line says, no person shall cause or permit stormwater to enter any drainage installation on site. So the curb is a necessity. You need to make sure that the the the, the 
the wastewater stays with you and the stormwater stays away from you. No person, or the local authority may by notice then uh, in order the owner of any site to execute at his own cost any precautionary measures required by the local authority to prevent that. And then if you go through the whole section here, you'll need it. The last one says, any person who contravenes or permits the contravention of any requirement, in other words, one or two, whether you're putting stormwater uh, drainage into the stormwater or stormwater into the drainage, or you ignore that letter or that notice served by the council, you will unfortunately be guilty of an offence. So you can, next time you ride past the car wash and you see any of these things happening next to the road, discharging into a natural stream, onto the stormwater, through the whole thing, nice little colour pictures, Unfortunately, we see more and more of these things all over. You can see as busy as this is, this is in the stormwater or in the lower point of that uh, section of road. Yeah, you can see this is basically just a, it's not, can't even call it a pipe. It's a discharge into a natural water course polluting the whole area. The, the flip side of the coin is, or the, even as far as the legal ones are concerned, the building regulation says that where any person has obtained approval to discharge into any drain, any liquid or solid matter, other than soil or wastewater, where any additional drainage and other installations, including, here we go, storage, pretreatment, in other words, you're separating the light liquids, you're keeping them, you're storing them, and meeting installations are required. As a condition of that approval, that person shall submit any plans or other details of that installation required by the local authority. Then we skip the nice bit and we go back to the, the point two that says any person who constructs an installation contemplated in subregulation one, other than in accordance with that approval, once again shall be guilty of an offence. So now you know, you pull over and you tell the guy, sorry, I mean, this is going to end up dropping into some hot water. Let's have a look at what we can do. And then just a quick touch base, seeing as we have looked at the drainage, there's always a water supply to these washing areas. And considering that um, there are a bunch of areas in, in um, our country that's been declared disaster or drought areas, these are becoming a bit of an issue. So we start with the, with the front runners as far as the drought's concerned. Cape Town had this hassle long ago, and you'll see that they put restrictions to non-residential customers. Any commercial car wash industry must comply with industry best practice regarding water usage for per car washed and recycle reuse 50% of that water used. Informal car washes to use buckets and not hose pipes and the washing of vehicles, trailers, caravans and boats with non-drinking water or cleaning with waterless products is strongly encouraged. I'm not going to read the whole thing for each of these towns, so see if you can see your, your area, if you are to be a sport in Brits. You'll find that happening and all commercial see 50% grease and oil traps must be installed by the owner and the effluent must conform to the standards prescribed by this bylaw. As I said earlier, they've all got these little tables that give you like a maximum that you can make a mess with and all the others will end up or if you exceed that, they're like giving you huge fines. So check your local authority bylaw. I'm not sure if yours is included in these ones I've got here, but they, most of them will do that, or most of them will include that. There's a P1 they call for 60%, and they even ask the guys to retrofit from when this was published. They need to go back three years to make sure that they comply with this section. Wolferstrand, Hermanus, Kleinmont, Gansby, all those nice little holiday spots here, the same thing. They require you to use 50 or to reuse 50% of the water and take note of all these things they refer to for reuse in that facility or on that property. You can't now discharge and take it away and use it somewhere else. It's for use on that property. So you make sure you get your, your things in order when it comes to getting the um, municipal compliance. This one here, Richards Bay in Pangeni, that area down there, you'll find that they've got a nice little going there. All commercial vehicle washing facilities shall be constructed and operated in such a manner that 50% of the water used by that facility is recycled for reuse in that process. All effluent, including reused effluent, must be disposed to the sewer in compliance with the national building regulations. In other words, there comes your, your traps and all the other details. 
and the exclusion of stormwater. No vehicle washing facility may commence operations after the promulgation of these bylaws without approval from the municipality. Appl application for approval to operate a vehicle facility must be made in a prescribed manner and non-compliance will revoke all um, or uh, in the imposition of a fine, excuse me. Um, basically what it means is that even if you do have approval or even if you do go ahead and have your whole, your plans approved, you have this whole thing built by the best contractors and all the rest of that and there's no maintenance done or you get caught discharging soapy water down a stormwater or vice versa, they'll simply come along if they fine you once, normally they, they start with a fine, warning, fine, and then it escalates and they'll close you down. So. If it's in their local bylaws, check your local bylaws to make sure that it complies or that your your the car washes around you comply. Approach them, say, look, this is, where, this is what we need to do and we'll take it from there. Since I started prepping this thing, oh, sorry, this presentation, um, there's been a publication in, I think it was October last year, SANS 3008 which is water efficiency in buildings. So we're going to do a whole series on, like we did for the energy, where you need to have lagging and solar and all the rest of that. We're now going to have to do water efficiency in buildings as well because we're running out of water. So according to the national standard for water efficiency in buildings, when it comes to vehicle wash facilities, the connections for high and low pressure water for washing and rinsing in other words, you can't wash with a bucket and then use a, a weapon saying I'm using less water. It includes washing and rinsing shall not exceed 10 liters per minute. So that sorts out the water bit. And then a minimum of 70% of the volume of potable water used for vehicle washing per day shall be harvested for reuse and recycling. So the, the bylaws ask for 50%, my hours ask for 60 and now they've come along and said, okay, but we need to do 70% to make sure that we don't end up not or, or riding around or driving around in brand new clean vehicles, but we don't have anything to drink. So we'll deal with water efficiency, look out for that. There's going to be a series around that. But in the meantime, as far as the vehicle washing facility is concerned, that's what we're looking at. In a perfect world, that's what we'd be looking for. We end up washing the vehicle, getting it clean, reclaiming the water, filtering it. We obviously don't want to sandblast the, the, the next vehicle. We end up filtering it and it goes back into the system and it'll move around. And if you get to that 70% mark, obviously there's going to be a 30% surplus on or per vehicle if your system complies. And then eventually that chamber or that system would have an overflow that ends up going into this drain and then into the sewer and off to the waste uh, or council's treatment facility. So this would be like the perfect scenario going forward. Um, we did something with the BCO yesterday and we are dealing with a number of them in like in person or, or in a group as far as the, the water efficiency in that's concerned. So if you're looking at a system this would be what you would like to see happening um, in your area. And if it's not, then there's an opportunity for you to step in and see that we can actually get something sorted or we can get involved in making sure we keep our water potable. Have we got any questions? All right, perfect, Munir. We have got a question here. The question reads, this might, um, or rather, how does one determine the volume of the light liquid separator? Um, I feel very guilty now on that question. There is, if you look at SANS 10400 Part B, where it says uh, washing areas, and also in 10252 Part 2, there's a section under light liquid interceptors. They actually give you a table that says that you need to have a look at. Um, the actual, the actual light liquid that you intend on. So for a car wash, you'd be using petrol and diesel. There's a density issue, and then they'll tell you that you need to look at flow rate, and you allow for that depth. Um, let's put it this way. I'd rather have that old-fashioned sand, oil, and grease trap. Um, let me just get that one. That one there. I'd rather have that oversized and taking its time and filling than trying to squeeze in the smallest one that you can get there. But 10252, if you look at light liquid interceptors, you'll find that there's a table referencing 
not only the the actual light liquid going in there, but also the rate of flow and all the rest of that. So I didn't put it in here because I didn't think I'd have enough time, but uh, thanks for that question. Right, 100%. That was the only question we have for you. So would you like to go ahead and end off? No problem. Guys, keep it, keep it safe out there. Enjoy your day and we'll chat again next week. All right, perfect. Um, I have got I have got another question that has come through, no but problem. I'm going to go ahead and send it to you via email because it okay, is a little 100%. bit off the topic. Um, no problem. Yeah, 100%. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. Um, thank you for taking the time out to actually um, go through the session with us this morning. I am going to go ahead and end the session off now. Please do remember the survey on the way out and enjoy the rest of your week, guys. Thanks so much again. Bye-bye.